Cool, cool. Um, just a quick housekeeping. Uh, toilets are just out through the front door, uh, second right in the corridor. Uh, emergency exit in the event uh, is on your right as you exit, uh, just next to the elevators. You will need to take 12 flights of stairs down, uh, out through the emergency exit, and assemble on the southwest of the corners over there. And uh, so to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we respect, we pay our respects to the uh, elders past, present, and emerging. So, welcome to the Adelaide Microsoft IT Pro Community uh, July 2024 meetup. Uh, I'm Andrew Young, and here is Adam Fowler. Uh, if you haven't met me before, if it's your first time at one of these, um, I'm a modern work and security pre sales guy at Digit Data. I uh, do a bit of partner enablement for our resellers. Uh, I've got all my socials on their QR code for LinkedIn, etc. Uh, the recording and show notes will be published on my blog there, uh, following the event. Hello, yes, so Adam Fowler. I am uh, at CyberCX now, uh, also in a pre sales type role, purely focused on Microsoft Cloud and security solutions in that space. Uh, before I went at Microsoft, this was my user group, which uh, Andrew's uh, had great hands. Um, so now I'm just uh, assisting where I can to help the user group um, take along. So it's come back full circle. Yeah, exactly, full circle. So <laughs> glad to be back. Um, I look forward to yeah, getting involved. Yeah. yeah of course, uh, thanks to Microsoft for getting us the venue to host the event. Uh, Systema Tech Consulting for the meetup group running. Uh, Digital data for some swag that I'll hand out at the end, and of course myself as whatever nibbles we have out, outside. I think there's some sweets and drinks. Uh, so yeah, we'll go through the what's new, what's coming. So in the SharePoint and team space, uh, start off with uh, SharePoint's getting a new content panel or pane for when you edit your pages and your news. So you'll be able to see the toolbox properties and design ideas. So design being the co-created AI fancy tools. Um, that will come out with a bunch of other stuff in our winter 2024 in the center there. And there's a bunch of other stuff coming out uh, in the remainder of the year that I'm looking forward to. Um, so over to Teams, there's a new, new VDI solution for your new Teams clients. Uh, currently in public preview, this replaces the old web RTC real-time communications protocol with a SlimCore protocol, uh, which is the one that's currently being used in the new Teams desktop client. So you'll see probably near parity uh, between two, two types of clients there, uh, but you'll have a better experience with your Teams client in VDI solutions such as Azure Virtual Desktop and Windows 365. If you're lucky enough to have Copilot for Microsoft 365, uh, there's a couple of new little features you can do now. So in your chat, when you're drafting a message, you can now adjust the length uh, or the tone of your message that you're drafted there. And on top of that, you can also set a custom tone where you can even set the language of your message. Presenter toolbar update. So in a Teams meeting, such as this one, for example, um, the toolbar now is movable, which previously it was stuck dead center at the top of your screen, so you couldn't see anything behind it. So if you were sharing a browser, you can switch between tabs. So now you can, you can move that the way. Uh, there's also an optimize button that will improve the audio and visual quality uh, to your viewers as well. Uh, yeah, this is a new one. So for your meetings that have transcription turned on, particularly for the co-pilot, your attendees now have to agree to be transcribed on top of being recorded. Um, so this goes a long way So with retention of these transcriptions as well. Um, they're moving away from storing that in your mailbox and now moving it to your OneDrive. So whoever hits transcribe will get a copy of the transcription in their OneDrive. Uh, the transition period, so it's going to be stored in both locations and will be removed from both locations if you delete it. Uh, but retention policies moving forward will be targeting your OneDrive to capture transcriptions. 
wonder what happens if you say no to that message when you're in a meeting or something. Mm -hmm. You can't do any of that. So you can't unmute, can't be recorded or share. Oh, so I'm just leave the so it's fine. Yeah, so you just become a, no, yeah, just an yeah, attendee. Yeah, cool. That's like webinar view. Yeah. Sometimes I, I, it feels superfluous asking it when they can't do it anyway. <laughs> Um, and this is a new one, so you can see it here. Um, there's a button on your taskbar now to mute yourself or unmute yourself in Teams meeting. Uh, particularly useful if you've got stacks of tabs and windows open and you can't see your Teams meeting. Um, so you can quickly do that, or you can hit Shift Control M or push the talk with Control Space. I wish they had a better yes. Control Space. Is not control too bad. Yeah, push the talk. It's still awkward. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, in the Intune and Windows space, uh, this one just talked the other day, config refresh. So if you've used through policy or even the policy CSV in Intune, uh, you may know that the refresh period for your policy is about 90 minutes and MVM is eight hours. So with this, you can now set it from anywhere between as short as 30 minutes to as long as 24 hours. Uh, it can also pause and resume the deployment of config as you will. And this gives you small control over how soon and when uh, devices can receive new config, I guess. Uh, this comes with Windows 11 May and June updates. Um, so, yeah, I think Jesper will touch on that if, in his presentation a little bit. As uh, a stack of new Intune resources, there's a tech community blog that comes with a whole bunch of learning materials and demo links and everything that you'd love to see. So that'll be in the show notes. A new Intune value calculator. So you plug in a few details and you get a pretty graph and some wild numbers. You do get the opportunity to edit the parameters to be something more realistic. Um, so then you can see over a three year course how much money you potentially save by having an yeah, MDM solution instead of 10 people managing all your devices. So numbers a bit dramatic, but yeah. <laughs> the investment is there. Uh, Copilot plus PCs. So we saw a recall on recall. Um, they updated their uh, their announcements uh, on this new feature, which records everything you do and lets you see it afterwards. So it's now not on by default. It is opt in, um, and you must have Windows Hello set up. So the database that lives on the machine is actually protected and can only you can only access the stuff uh, through that solution. So the just-in-time decryption of that data is behind Windows Hello uh, enhanced sign-on security features. So it's a good step in the right direction. Um, I do feel like Microsoft may have jumped the gun a little on that announcement as they were trying to get it in for Microsoft Builds keynote the next day. And we had a launch event in Sydney at the Microsoft Reactor um, office building store, we're going to call it. Uh, friendly MVPs, Kirsty McGrath and Daniel Anderson were present, um, spruiking obviously the, the latest and greatest in AI PCs. An Entra and Purview, we've now got a new Entra PowerShell module. Uh, it works alongside the graph modules, but if you are using an older version of, say, Azure AD module, you can now start transitioning over by enabling aliases. So you still use the same module, but you're using the newer commandlets. Just to get more familiarization happening there. See the new purview portal has rolled out, or if it hasn't, it should have by now. Um, just a better unified experience in managing your information protection solutions. No comment? comment. <laughs> it's yeah, it's, it's one of the different thing. things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this one's from I think his name is Merrill. Yeah. Fernando. Uh, yeah. So he's a Microsoft employee, and he's got this site now that lets you browse and add uh, AKMS links. So only Microsoft employees can generate these. Um, they're really handy if you've got them. But uh, this page, this screenshot doesn't do it justice. But there's hundreds, if not almost a thousand plus yeah. of these links. If there's any, almost any Microsoft material, there's probably an AKMS shortcut link for it. Yeah. Um, can you and those are just the ones. And those are just the ones that you can see. There are stack more internal ones as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. I do like the third one there, aka MS1. Um, yes, but <laughs> so often they're also maintained. So some maybe they point to uh, you know, a voucher or something, but the voucher changes now and then they will 
usually someone will have to update the AKMS link. So it can be handier mm. for saving the, those MS links than the direct link to the content. Yeah. yeah. So it has. Um, of course, there's ninja training for all the different defender types and security solutions from Microsoft. So once you've gone through that, free learning and self-assessment. You can then look at the cloud native app protection policies ebook. A lot of content on those so much stuff. Uh, ninja training. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, well on the subject of learning, uh, there's more applied skill scenarios. So even more technologies where you can test yourself. It's a free assessment it goes for about two hours. Um, get onto it if you haven't. It's, a, it's kind of a, a gateway to doing exams for certification. Uh, I did one of those yesterday, the um, Active Directory Domain Services. That's actually the on-premises Active Directory skills thing. So it gives the VM to play around and go through a scenario, adding a you know, domain controller and changing roles, etc. So if you play with anything that's in the applied skills, it's it's a good test of your um, knowledge or, or to learn something new if you haven't done it before. Cool. Uh, we touched on this last month, but there are new plans and career paths in Microsoft Learn. So, for example, this is based on, I guess, the certifications and you know, the topic areas you prefer. Uh, and then that leads you to a, a plan, which is the course content, which was formerly known as a learning path. So all the modules that you need for that specific certification can be found there. Uh, with the plans part, there is also the team plan, so you can create or curate your own uh, plans, publish them, and then assign them to your team members, and then you can track their progress um, as they go through it. Uh, also with that, Dynamics certifications updates, they're consolidating three exams into one that will come Emberish. So keep your eyes out for that if you're in the business app space. And uh, check out the expert zones, that's free assessments, and you get accreditation badges. And Microsoft Partners, you can check out new level up, new, old, new. Um, but for partners, they can uh, go through this course. Um, the enrollment code is locked behind certain events. So if you attend those partner calls, you may see the uh, the link and then the enrollment code to get that. So that's where you get those, um, you know, those new badges that are coming out right now, the level up branding. The 30 days to learn it skills challenge. Um, it's currently in pause, so they're giving us a new experience soon. I think over the next month and a half, um, we'll see something come out from that. But that was traditionally a learning path that had 30 days set of time limit. If you completed it within that time, you get a 50% off voucher for your exams. So it was a pretty popular thing, so I imagine they, they want to keep that one going. The Microsoft Learn student ambassadors. So I do recommend any you know, students in TAFE or UD currently studying IT to have a look at this. Uh, it's free to join, get onto the Discord server and you get access to some benefits off the bat. But uh, I would yeah, recommend trying to get you know, beta or gold awards so that you get some more swag, but also you get the opportunity to get mentored by uh, Microsoft MVPs and potentially become one as well. And uh, yeah, that'd be a great entry to your career as well. Highly valuable. There's also a ANZ Microsoft Student Accelerator meetup. Um, try and get one to Adelaide soon. Help. <laughs> yeah, so watch that okay. space. Yeah, watch that space. Uh, just rip around the Adelaide Microsoft community. So we've got several other user groups, um, most of which are in person. Yep, so we're all on Meetup, so if you have a look around, do a quick search, make sure you register. What's this question mark on? What's going on there? I don't know. Um, there isn't one yet. Well, uh, or is there? I don't know. That's what I was asking. That's right, yeah. So if anyone wants to run a user group, particularly in security products for Microsoft, let us know. <laughs> uh, otherwise, we'll just yeah, run with some of those, some of those topics ourselves. Yeah. Uh, what's coming, uh, a bit of a plug here, so there's a for DICA partners, um, there's a GRC, Governance, Risk and Compliance, Security Labs. It's all on Microsoft Purview, but I'll, I will be delivering one on next Thursday on uh, loss prevention. Um, for later in the month, we've got Digital Workplace Conference, and then we've got the Power Platform Conference and Ignite uh, later in the year overseas. 
Speaking of Digital Workplace Conference, um, there we go. This will be taking place at the Sockertel Sydney Wentworth. Um, happens every year. They rotate between Sydney and Melbourne for Australia, but uh, can you tell then as far as that goes on? Um, anything to do with modern work, power platform, um, digital transformation, and the lot. Uh, there'll be topics running both days. There's, I think they added an extra stream, so there's four different streams of sessions. So plenty of content. Um, I myself and Daniel Brown presenting at conference on day two. Uh, and also, yeah, drum roll. Um, so the winner of our ticket draw. Um, it'll be me. No, it's not. Okay. Okay. Oh, you get a ticket anyway. Uh, it's Mr. Chicken. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'll speak to you afterwards. Okay, so coming up for us, we've got hopefully Tim Peters still next month for Threat Intelligence through Defender and Microsoft Sentinel. Um, we may do a session on purview and then got a couple of empty slots. So if you feel free to request some topics or you want to present, um, give that QR code, fill out the form. And uh, December, we'll have a joint AMC event. I don't know what we'll do yet, but um, December's pretty quiet usually, so we'll try and make it fun. Yeah, that's enough of me talking. So hopefully Jasper is on the call. Uh oh, I I am. Oh, excellent. Feel free to take control. We'll go leave early. <laughs> cool. Uh, so handing over to Jasper. Let him introduce yeah. himself and how amazing he is. And I will. Uh, yeah. There we go, everyone in the room can see Jasper now. So, what's, the, what's the time where you are at the moment, Jasper? Uh, quarter past eight in the morning. By the way. In the morning, all right. Yeah. I hope you've had a coffee for this one then. I, I, I don't know about AM, PM. We use, you know, 24 hours here. So it's eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yep, fair enough. Everything's fine. 3.48 uh, PM in Adelaide. There you go. There you go. I don't see <clears throat> any presentation. Let's try to do something else. Uh, Spying time while Andrew is looking small quickie. That's it. So I assume. Yeah, so he's sharing now. So that should be good. We can see it. We're good. Yep, we can see your screen. Cool. And yourself. Awesome. Okay. Um, because I'm sharing, the, okay. I, uh, because I'm sharing the screen, I don't see, um, I can't see the chat at the moment. So if, if anybody, we'll, we'll keep can, an eye, we'll keep an eye on it. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for, thanks for having me. It was a bit of, um, a reach out, uh, a few days ago. No. Oh maybe even a month ago that that resulted in in me being here um i was like uh, yeah i could do a session and uh, we talked about topics and i had a few uh, ideas and uh, they kind of said well can you do all the, the three of them so within the next 45 minutes i'll try to cover as much ground as i can i have built a few slides but i prefer to do um, demonstrations i do have a few um assumptions, uh, which might kick me in the head a bit later, but uh, we'll take that as we go. I usually don't present myself, but my name is Jesper. I, uh, I've been doing Windows for, yeah, since Windows 3.1, which means I'm about 250 years old or something like that. Um, but otherwise, uh, I know you guys are, are down here somewhere. And uh, yeah, due to the time difference, I am all the way up just about the other side of the world. So I hope sound, picture, internet, everything is working okay. Um, even going uh, half around the globe. So please let me know if anything sort of happens to this and um, let's just dive in. As I mentioned, um, I was proposing a few topics and uh, today I was um, 
fortunate enough to be able to talk about what what sort of we gave the name modern provisioning and, and update management. Basically, it's a session all about autopilot and one of my old favorites, uh, Windows Auto Patch. Um, I do. Uh, my first assumption is that everybody's on the call will know what auto. Uh, pilot is, and I also hope that most of you will know about auto patch. Um, otherwise, please let me know. Um, so I kind of dive into the topics, uh, yeah, from the from below, and then I want to share a lot of uh, sort of uh, um, experiences with with this and uh, what's let me call Jesper's best practice or wherever all these technologies had actually kicked me on, on the knee and uh, I want to share that. So basically, uh, modern provisioning um, in my world, that will be Windows Autopilot, meaning um, I've built all sort of Windows platforms using all sort of deployment tools um, from MDT, config manager, etc. Uh, whereas uh, Windows Autopilot is is more like a process, it's not a deployment tool. And if I had a, a dollar for every time I heard some somebody talking about Autopilot and imaging, uh, I would be a rich man today. So there's no imaging in, in Autopilot. This is just a process of using whatever on, on the device uh, when we get it delivered from, from uh, the vendor. And of course, we have the modern management in my world that will be in tune. You can use... Uh, other uh, solution, but if you want to use Autopilot and the last one, uh, Windows Auto Patch, uh, Intune will be sort of the main uh, engine for that. Um, I bet everybody, I hope everybody knows uh, about Intune and, and how everything is connected. Uh, looking at the introduction, I'm, I'm pretty sure you are well aware how all these things uh, work together. So this is my world. It's Windows 10, Windows 11, Microsoft Intune, Autopilot, Autopilot, Autopatch. Um, this is where I am. Um, when everybody asks, uh, anybody asks about config manager, I usually get a, a bit pale and, and I reach out to an adult uh, to get help with that. So this is why I, I work every day. Um, I do uh, unfortunately do a lot of co-pilot as well, but uh, today we will leave that. There's a few uh, words of attention I want to share with you. Um, I might say something really um, crazy stuff like, uh, are you Windows ready yet? Um, up here in the Northern Hemisphere, um, we have discovered a lot of our customers we work with, they, they are trying to become Windows 11 ready. Turns out they're not even Windows 10 ready. Um, and then you should have a small smiley there. Um, meaning, what does it take to be become Windows 11 ready? Well, exactly the same, but one thing, um, as it used to be to be Windows 11, uh, sorry, Windows 10 ready. Meaning the hardware needs to configure it, you know, credential guard needs to be enabled. Of course, you use uh, some sort of uh, hard disk encryption and, and so on. So there's only a few sort of extras that needs to be added to be Windows 11 ready, but at least you need to be Windows 10 ready. Um, I'm the one saying um, we don't want to do hybrid joint and we definitely don't want to do hybrid Windows uh, autopilot, meaning uh, whatever I'd say from now on going forward means that Everything we want to do is cloud only or cloud native, what is uh, something Microsoft calls it. So that needs to be put in uh, in bold. Um, I'm also the ambassador of uh, this more self-service, less required apps. And it will make sense uh, in a few minutes why I, I keep saying that. So I hope that we will have a day where people will, whatever application they need, they will be able to go into for instance, the company portal or store and actually get it by themselves. We have to stop, you know, pushing hundreds and hundreds of apps to, to our devices. And then um, there's this Windows Hello for, for business readiness. Um, that will make sense in a minute, but what, what I mean with that. Um, but when we start doing cloud only and cloud native or whatever we call it, and we want to be able to connect to, that could be internal resources in a domain, et cetera. Uh, we do experience a lot of issues with uh, the possibility for for logging in um, when you authenticate uh, to, towards the domain controller. And as you hopefully know, 
being a, on a cloud native device, you will be able to authenticate towards uh, domain resources. There's a few things you need to be aware of, and one of them is uh, being ready for Windows Hello for Business. I'll come back to that in a, in a second. So this is a Microsoft slide. Um, I actually brought it in um, because I thought the numbers was amazing. Um, so quite a few devices is currently deployed uh, with autopilot um, and uh, quite a few devices actually cloud only uh, devices and most of them which is, is used to do it meaning it, it's something that the user is actually uh, working with and as the quote says um, most people will be able to use autopilot um at least in the current version um there's another autopilot rolling out at the moment and we'll have a look at that as well um on the other hand we also have uh, a few outstandings uh, using uh whatever the oem is delivering um i'm currently working on <laughs> on a quite annoying task, to be honest, um, because most Windows devices delivered in uh, in Europe is pre-installed with uh, Microsoft Office, which is fine. However, um, I would say 80% of the customers I work with, they want their own Office uh, configuration, meaning we have to remove part of the Office products. Um, most devices delivered today will be installed with the old Teams client. Customers want to use the new Teams client, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And actually, there's no way to easily replace the installed Office application during an autopilot deployment. Um, so we've been playing around with a way to basically remove the install Office um, and then install our own. Another reason is that. Um, here in, in, in Northern Europe, most larger companies is preferring to use US English as the OS. Um, and most devices delivered uh, from OEMs will have like 20, 25 different language packs as part of the office installation, meaning uh, it takes forever to actually remove it and, and reinstall Office. So we are playing around with that. But otherwise, Autopilot is, is quite cool. and. Uh, does what it what it what it's supposed to um there's a few catches and uh, i'll bring a few of them up uh, in a second so if i were to share three ways to optimize any windows autopilot scenario of course oh, yeah i did say of course um i will always um, enable uh, enrollment status space which is the esp meaning i want uh, to block the screen or a desktop from the user until the the device is ready. Meaning, um, I also want to have a few apps installed as part of the enrollment status page. So let's say that could be um, Office, as we just talked about. Um, and I always recommend having some sort of a desired state configuration package, meaning you have any apps you want to remove, you have some pre-configurations like registry settings, um, and other uh, things, we do struggle a bit with time zone formatting and, and other stuff um, because we're using US English OS, but we are in a completely different area than, than the OS is built for. So we have to pre-configure um, time zone and uh, formatting and uh, etc. So we do that. And it does say add five or less applications uh, as part of the ESP. Uh, I know there's a, a much higher limitation on, on the ESP these days, um, but it'll make sense in a second why we do that. And the reason why we have chosen five is po if possible, uh, never above 10 uh, will be that we want to have the user to have their desktop available as soon as possible without having to wait too much, um, so we don't wait for huh, Adobe Reader, whatever. We only await uh, for the very uh, important application, and primarily that would be Office. Um, if a customer wants to deploy, I don't know, the, um, SAP or something similar, that can wait. It will it will come come on eventually. We don't want to uh, delay the ESP uh, out of that. The last thing is um, now I said I want to enable 
uh, enrollment status page, uh, we do prefer and recommend uh, actually disabling the Windows, um, sorry, the user part of the user enrollment status page, meaning that after the first initial device and, and uh, computer uh, part of the enrollment has finished, the user will get a uh, at a desktop and will be able to work, meaning anything applied or assigned for the user will be um, installed after the desktop is, is available. The reason for this is that, well, there's two reasons really. The first one is that it's usually the user part of the ESP that is failing. Um, and, 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 and secondly, um, this is how the new autopilot will, will work anyway. So we've been doing this for for quite some time, and we have a very high, uh, high success rate on, on using autopilot. So that will be sort of my three ways to optimize Windows autopilot scenarios, uh, and basically any scenarios. And uh, this is the, the default setting um, we use. Then there's a few things about being uh, Windows autopilot ready. That is more like if you are just, uh, you know, getting onto the journey and start doing cloud-only uh, devices. Of course, be Windows Server ready and uh, yeah, Windows 10 ready as well. Autopilot works quite well with Windows 10. Uh, so that that will be the main reason. Um, then we we want to show you a few things about, uh, or I want to show you a few things about uh, Windows Hello for Business control rollout. If you're not aware, I will just go through quickly what what we prefer to do. And the last thing is if you have existing devices uh, in whatever environment you have, they could be like managed by configuration manager, could be managed uh, in, in a co-pilot, uh, sorry, in a command setup. You maybe have existing devices already in Intune. I highly recommend um, enabling Windows Auto Patch. Uh, the main reason for that will be that that will give you opportunity to make sure that uh, drivers, firmwares, etc., is is actually on a on a decent level before you're going forward and maybe start resetting devices to enroll them using autopilot or, or similar. So whatever existing uh, devices you have, please, please, please make sure you replace the Vsauce, the good old Vsauce server, and start uh, considering using Windows Auto Pads. However, I know there's a um, uh, licensing limitation, uh, AutoPads, it does require a certain uh, set of licenses. If you do not have license to Windows AutoPads, I still highly recommend considering using Windows Update for Business, which is part of uh, of the standard Windows, uh, sorry, Microsoft Intune uh, configuration. Windows AutoPads is basically Windows Update for Business with a few extras, so uh, at least if you don't have the license for AutoPatch, please consider using Windows Update for Business. It will help you going, going forward. This is uh, just a screenshot. Uh, unfortunately, I was only having uh, this one in Danish, so this is freely translated. If you experience users uh, logging in with Windows Hello for Business and they get this annoying message saying the message, sign in message you're trying to use, um, you, it's not allowed. Well, this is where you might not be, um, what's it called, Windows Hello for Business uh, ready. Uh, there's a quite easy fix for this. This is basically something about updating um, a certificate template for, for your domain controllers uh, to allow Capros. It's, uh, it's a 30 minute uh, task. Uh, it does it it does work quite after that or you could consider using one of the other technologies one of them is like a cloud trust um but this one is 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 basically what i mean if uh, to be windows low for business ready um if you do have a challenge or you need to make a change to make this work um you have to disable windows low for business uh, as part of uh the enrollment, otherwise everybody using Windows Autopilot will be enrolled into uh, Windows Hello for Business as part of the initial uh, enrollment. And this is where I highly recommend uh, creating this Windows Hello for Business rollout, or controlled ro ro rollout. So let's have a, a quick look what all this is. And um, Just going to um, the first one, which could be 
or will we be controlled roll out of Venezuela for business? Um, within your enrollment um, in, in, in June, we have the Windows Hello for Business uh, vein. In this case, you will have uh, the default one is not configured, meaning uh, Windows will behave uh, by default and that will be enrolling the device into Windows Hello for Business as part of the autopilot process. In this case, make sure that it's disabled and I know it's crazy, you can see all the settings. However, disable will be the preferred way. This is a tenant right configuration, meaning uh, if you disable this, uh, nobody nobody will actually be asked to enroll in Windows Hello for Business as part of uh, an autopilot configuration. And people will be able to log in using a traditional username and password. If you do experience um, the screenshot I showed you about uh, the login issue, uh, if you want to test quickly whatever this is caused by the missing uh, Capros validation, uh, what you could ask the user to do is actually log out of your device and change the login method to username password, try again, and uh, I'll say nine out of 10 times that will resolve the issue and then you'd know you have a task. So step one, um, disable Windows Low for Business within the enrollment, meaning that is now disabled for everybody in my tenant. And afterwards, I go into the endpoint security, um, uh, account protection, and then I basically create a Windows Low for Business uh, policy. And I assign that policy to uh, whatever group is, is, is required. In this case, I have assigned it uh, to all users. However, there will be um, people in, in, in the community saying when it's a local business should actually be assigned to all devices or a group of devices. Um, so again, depending on what your preferred method is, um, I would recommend using um, a device group for assigning the Windows Hello for Business um, in this control matter. Again, it's all about how this is working going forward. So in this case, uh, I, I highly recommend change that. If we just go into uh, the other endpoint security, um, I did mention, sorry, disk encryption. And if we have, um, in this case, BitLogger, um, some people think it's pretty cool to assign this to users as well. But again, um, in the native of, of Autopilot, this policy should be assigned as soon as possible in part of the autopilot configuration, meaning this should always be assigned to a, a device group. There's a way that if you actually do choose to, if you just scroll down and you'll see, I do not require any uh, disk encryption. Um, I do require disk encryption, but I, I do not um, configure any um, key strength, meaning if you want to do 256, that needs to be configured in the policy and the policy actually needs to be applied um, when the device is enrolled into Intra. Otherwise, you will end up with a 128 um, encryption, which is the default. So again, uh, de depending on how your environment are configured, uh, I highly recommend anything in the endpoint security policies to be assigned uh, to devices, including, including uh, Windows Hello for Business. Cool. I just have to go back to see. Oh, yeah. Um, the enrollment status page, uh, again, it's uh, within the enrollment. Um, where is it? Oh, here it is. And I basically created a, a, a policy that overrules the default one, and I have now configured uh, my enrollment status page. And down here I have uh, these uh, blocked apps. In this case, I use only use three. In this case, I don't even deploy Office, but it's more like a demo tenant, so it's, it's the reason. Um, but again, we have um, 
the company portal, which is quite important uh, at the moment. And then we have uh, the disaster state configuration tool, and you can add a, another. There's a, a quite large limitation here. Um, I believe it's, is it 100? I uh, can't even remember. Uh, but but please, please don't don't go above uh, about 10. Um, you can add more. Just make sure that um, you only add up to, well, if you could go for five per autopilot profile, that would be preferable. So this is like, again, uh, tenant white. This is for all autopilot profiles. So it's more like a combination. But if you can limit um, the blocked apps, uh, you will have a higher success rate. And again, uh, these apps will only be assigned to devices and that will be because in my configuration here, I actually created a, a policy, uh, which basically is a, a custom policy. That's the only way, at least for now, you can do this. Where I configure this, uh, this setting, let's go edit. Good one. Um, so this setting is actually disabling the user part of the ESP, meaning the user will never see that part. Uh, again, securing a higher uh, success rate when using uh, when using autopilot. There's various reasons to do that, um, but I highly recommend uh, using this one uh, as well. Uh, yeah. And then the, the last bit, I have in this tenant enabled the uh, auto patch and it's all down here within the auto patch. And now we have an option. I'll get back to that in a second. Um, if you do not have auto patch, I highly recommend creating uh, your own um, Windows Update for Business uh, policies. In this case, you'll see all the AutoPads policies is created automatically. We got feature updates. Um, we don't have any uh, quality updates as part of uh, Windows AutoPads, but if you do Windows Update for Business, please uh, keep your eyes out, or eyes out for the expedited up, uh, quality updates. And the main driver for using Windows Update for Business, driver management, it's awesome. Uh, being able to deploy both drivers and firmware uh, for a various number of, of, of hardware and, and, and built in net drivers, or whatever, is, is just fantastic. And of course, you will be able to, to monitor the whole thing. Um, and it's not the best in the world, but it's definitely uh, becoming uh, better and, and, and better. So, There's a new thing in uh, in autopilot, which I think is semi okay uh, for now. Uh, to start with, it was called Windows Autopilot 2.0, um, and then it was uh, released, and it's now called Windows Autopilot Device Preparation. And um, it's kind of the Windows Autopilot for tomorrow. Um, there's a few things with it. It does have a, a nice redesign, which is, of course, nice. Um, I think the main driver here is it doesn't require you guys to uh, harvest these hash values. Uh, on the other hand, um, if you are using um, a company or you buy the, the, your devices at a, at a vendor, they can add uh, those devices to your autopilot uh, for you um, prior to sending uh, the device to the user. Um, however, um, we as a, as a normal customer is only allowed to add devices using uh, the harvest hash value, but um, partners will be able to add devices using a serial number. It's all about proof of ownership. But going forward, we will be able to, to, to do this ourselves. But to start with, um, this is this is autopilot without pre-registering, which is quite cool. 
Um, it also have this uh, one uh, enrollment status page, if you wish, or the, uh, the simplified OB view, uh, Microsoft calls it, meaning this is where uh, disabling the user ESP actually makes sense because this is more like aligned with, with Autopilot um, for tomorrow. Um, there's one thing that I do like because uh, when you add a device to Autopilot um, in, in the old way, it will take a few hours, maybe even uh, eight, before everything is synced and the device is properly assigned to some dynamic groups and etc. Meaning uh, being ready to de be deployed can take uh, a few hours before all the policies and settings and application is properly assigned. This is not an option with with uh, with with autopilot device preparation because everything is happening at sign in, meaning the user go down to the local store, buy a device, uh, turns it on and uh, select this as a corporate device and, and you will log in with your corporate uh, uh, email address and the whole autopilot thing will, will start from there. Meaning if the user had to wait for all these dynamic groups to sync, they will never get any um, applications or for that sake policies unless everything is assigned to all users or all devices. Um, so there's a, a way to actually, um, as part of this, uh, add the device to a predefined group, meaning going forward, you have to make sure that all these groups, uh, sorry, that preferred group is actually uh, assigned to the proper policies, um, but that will be part of the enrollment that also pilot device preparation will add the device uh, to the group. And then um, there's a whole sort of user experience thing added to this. Um, I'm not sure I, I completely agree in the current version that it, it's so user friendly as, as they tell us. Um, I do see some benefits of this. Uh, I do like the new, uh, the new uh, UI uh, and I think it will help users to be, become ready for, for, for doing the work uh, faster. Um, so if I go back to my um, Intune, go back to enrollment, everybody should now have this device, what is also about device preparation section within uh, the enrollment. And if I just go uh, device preparation policies, I already created a policy and just copy that. And uh, let's try to do another one. So let's call this V2. Do a quick description. So this is where I have to select a group. And this is the group I just talked about. This is the group that device um, uh, will be member of when, when enrolled. And um, they recently changed that. Uh, that needs to be a static group. It won't work with a with a dynamic group. Uh, let me just uh, select one. I'm sure I have a group. Who is it? There you go. Then we have uh, configuration settings, very similar to the, to, yeah, let's call it the old autopilot configuration. We have the deployment method. In this case, I can only select user driven, makes sense, because this is happening when the user log, uh, logs in. We only have single user for the deployment time. And in this case, you can only select Microsoft Interjoin, and this is not because I don't have a connector. So autopilot device preparation will be cloud only only, that's a lot of onlys. Um, and officially, uh, core management is not supported. So that's uh, another limitation there. Um, I have a few users that, or, sorry, customers that actually have managed to install the, um, the configuration manager agent afterwards. It makes all sort of weird scenarios coming through, so it's not supported. Um, and then we have this, um, what should happen if something goes wrong? You have like 30 minutes, contact support. 
oh, sorry, I did drop this, uh, whatever you should be user, standard user administrator, very similar. Um, and then down here, I have the option to block my uh, ESP for a number of apps. In this case, it's important to say, you can only select 10 manage apps. Uh, however, in this case, it's actually per profile. So if you have some users that does require more than uh, 10 apps to be installed uh, as part of the enrollment status page, um, you have to reconsider how you will do this going forward. And that is why I keep saying never add more than five apps if possible. Uh, that will make the whole deployment and or, or provisioning way more uh, stable and much easier to to manage and it will give the user the opportunity to work faster if you don't have to wait for that. Um, don't get me wrong, uh, whatever apps is assigned to user or device will be installed uh, as part of uh, the normal Intune uh, app deployment. However, you can only assign up to 10 apps uh, per profile in device preparation policies and you will be able to add uh, up to 10 scripts, which is the standard PowerShell scripts uh, we know. Um, I am the one saying I bloody hate PowerShell script in Intune. Uh, I think they are running randomly. We don't know if they run. We don't really know the results of the scripts. So if you do have scripts that is some kind of required, I, I often tend to uh, repack that PowerShell script as an application package. Uh, I did mention that I have my uh, desired um, this our state configuration um, script, which is basically a PowerShell script, which is wrapped within a, an application. Um, so you can add whatever apps you have. I could select my this our state configuration. I want uh, the company portal, and I do have two. So which one is what? This is one of the sort of issues with with the new UI in Intune, I just add one of them. Actually, I add both, see what happens. And I go there and then I can add scripts. In my case, I only have one. And that is basically um, the Windows Auto Patch uh, enrollment scripts. So I don't want to add that, that is done automatically. But I don't use uh, PowerShell script as part of my deployment. Uh, I want more control. Um, so in this case, uh, I kind of created uh, my profile. Um, uh, and now you can see there's something here. You've got Microsoft Company Portal, and it just says Preview, which is Preview. So I'll just remove that one because I want the, the new one. I go forward. Scope tax. Uh, if you don't use scope tax, just ignore that. If you have a scheme for scope tax, do whatever you usually do. And now I have to assign this uh, policy to a set of users. And again, uh, I can set all users default, which absolutely doesn't make sense because I already assigned another um, profile to, to that group. So again, depending on how many profiles you want, in this case, I, I create another profile where the user is a standard user. The other profile I have, the user is a local admin. It's easier for for the whole, um, let's just do that, for the whole test and, and, and deployment. And now I have this nice overview. Um, so to start with, I have the device group. I wanna add the device to this group when it's enrolled. I have my settings, I have my scope tags, and I have my uh, assignments. So I go save, and then I get this error message. And what's that about? Well, oh, it's the device group. So there's an issue uh, with my group. And if I just go back to this one, I can't remember the group name now. I have to go back to my intra-admin. 
go into groups or groups and now I just find this group. This is very important setting. Um, it is very important that the, that the group you choose is owned by Intune Autopilot Confidential Client. If you don't configure that, you will not be able to select the particular group for your deployment. Oh, sorry, the, the, the target group. Um, so that is uh, something you need to be aware of. It can be done automatically, but when you create a group, um, let's say I want to do another group here, um, make sure that the owner is configured so uh, so Intune will be able to, to add the, the device to the group. That is probably the number one uh, issue, if you wish. Uh, however, uh, you will not be able to uh, assign a group today. Um, you, you, you're good that to start with, um, but there's a check for that uh, today. So everything needs to be done. So make sure you, when you create a group that you add a owner to a particular group. Uh, so what I could do, I could go. Yeah. And again, if I just go here and say, who is this assigned to? It's also assigned to all users, meaning um, I will get a conflict now. If, if a user logs in, um, it will be like having two autopilot profiles. Uh, Windows will get confused and, and it will just go boom. Um, so make sure that that you don't have any overlapping uh, group memberships here. I have to say, if a device is already registered um, within the enrollment, if we go down here to, to my devices, so if the device is added to the, let's call it the old autopilot, uh, device registration, um, that will win because that is actually happening way before the user login. So the old autopilot won, that, that that will win. And if the device is either not assigned or it's not even part of uh, your autopilot configuration, um, the user will uh, get asked all these questions about who you are, what shoe size do you use, where do you live, etc. And uh, one thing that is uh, kind of a, um, an issue uh, I think is that the user can actually choose that this is a private device and meaning you will not get into the autopilot uh, enrollment. So it's very important that the user will choose that the device is a, a corporate device uh, as part of the normal enrollment. I'm told Microsoft or the Windows team is planning to change that. Um, how do you do it? I don't know. Um, be aware there's a few uh, things if you want to test this out that, that you have uh, you have to go to the documentation, make sure your device is properly uh, uh, patched. There's a KB article that needs to be there, but if you use one of the newer Windows Insider builds, it, it works just uh, perfect. Um, yeah, so I have this uh, sort of slide with, with all these limitations, um, and it, it's not a limitation as such. Um, but it will be when you compare to the current Windows Autopilot. So the number one issue, I'll call it an issue, um, limitation, there's no computer naming option uh, in the current version. So if you, like me, have a, a craving on you want to name your devices in a certain way, that is currently not supported within the Autopilot um, device preparation. You to do some scripting and do some fancy stuff there, please be aware that totally test it. As uh, so renaming the device too early will break the link between the device and the certificate, meaning the whole thing will um, will stop working. So uh, be aware of that. I am told that there will be an option uh, at a later state, but the, the problem here is that uh, that when enrolling a normal device um, you are actually asked about the computer name so the whole process is actually over so it's all about timing here um, i'm told that microsoft is looking into some sort of renaming functionality 
you can rename the device uh, using Intune later on, uh, but for now, there's no naming. Um, as mentioned, there's only 10 man's apps and 10 scripts in the ESP. However, it's per profile. Um, so you can have multiple profiles assigned to various users, uh, departments, whatever you choose. Um, but again, please, please uh, try to keep it as low as possible. That will help you going, uh, going forward. Whatever you use scripts or not, I'm not a fan, um, so I try not to use scripts if 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 I can't get away with it. Um, as I said, uh, the delayed intradynamic group usage, uh, it doesn't really work in this scenario. So that's why the enrollment time grouping uh, is the solution. Um, in the slide deck, there's, this, there's links for all this. Well, that's actually quite cool. Um, however, you can only choose uh, one group, so, so consider it wisely. Um, how this should be uh, configured or designed. Um, you can only assign these policies to users. Perfectly makes sense um, because it's actually based on the user login. If you want to assign stuff to devices, you have to keep using the current or the old Windows Autopilot setup, meaning you have to um, register devices, etc., as we have done for yeah for years. Uh, and then we have this thing, um, and and it's meant that it's actually down here. Um, it does require you to allow personal devices, meaning if you have a enrollment restriction saying you will not allow personal devices into your tenant uh, in Intune, uh, this will not work. Um, meaning um, the corporate identifier uh, is a thing, so this will be the way to to assign devices to your tenant going forward. Um, as you might know it from uh, mobile devices like iOS and Android. Um, however, uh, it was there for, for a few weeks and then it disappeared. I did notice uh, some of the community, some people from the community actually posted yesterday that uh, Corporate Identifiers is now back online in Intune for Windows devices. Unfortunately, I don't see it. If you if you just go in here, um, let's do a full refresh of this one. Just to, and we go into enrollment. We have the corporate identifiers up here where we can add our devices. You go add. You can do it manually. There will be another line here we're looking for. Um, I think and it, it it does say something about uh, hardware and then Windows something only, um, but unfortunately, I, I don't have it in my tenant, so I'm not able to to show you. But this is one of the uh, the things that, that is currently missing, um, that we can add identifiers, and this is where you can actually add your own devices based on serial number, meaning you, you can add them, but without having the hassle of, of harvesting the hash value, etc. So I think this is a, it's a, a good way to control it. And when it's my understanding that when you add your your devices to uh, with these identifiers, you will then be able to keep having uh, your enrollment restrictions uh, in, in, in place. Uh, which I believe uh, a lot of companies is actually uh, using these days to avoid having personal devices uh, enrolled into um into your uh, in tune uh, tenant i feel like you've been speed talking what's the time i'm still good is time still okay yep and i assume no questions uh is um is in the chat or anything so please stop me if if i keep going no questions, just an enthralled audience. Cool. Maybe they fall asleep. They fall asleep. Um, just to finish up, um, my all-time favorite, well, with autopilot, is is the auto patch functionality. Um, at least I was one of the early adapters of Windows Update for Business. I thought that was absolutely awesome. Um, this is just an extension to Windows Update for Business. Uh, it makes uh, 
one thing easier. Uh, otherwise, it's it's basically the same. Um, but if you want to do modern uh, management and and all these uh, things, I highly recommend looking into uh, Windows Update for Business and in this case Windows Auto Patch, uh, if you have the license for it. So everybody knows about Visas, Config Manager, and, and Intune, and the Windows Update for Business Plumbing Service, and it's sort of evolved over the years. Um, I haven't seen any sort of news about WVSOS for quite some time. Uh, I know it's still there. I think the the best addition to, to WVSOS was when Microsoft announced uh, the Azure Automation Update Management, meaning you can start using uh, cloud services for, for servers and, and not in tune devices, which I thought was cool. Uh, and, and I'm really the spokesman for getting rid of this as, as, double, as fast as possible. Um, I think it's it's outdated. Um, but again, the main reason for, for, for moving to the Windows Update for Business and Windows Auto Patch, and in my opinion, it's not just patching and, and updates, it, it's the whole driver of firmware management. I think this actually makes uh, the whole thing uh, work. So basically, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a marketing, it's a cloud service, and it, it does automate everything for you. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of stuff happening when, when you enable that, but basically what you get, you get uh, Windows patching, you get Office patching, you have a few things about um, Microsoft Edge, and there's absolutely nothing about uh, Teams, but it's still part of the official documentation. Uh, but you get the quality updates. We have feature updates, which is quite cool. Uh, way to, to go from one version of Windows to the next. Um, Windows driver and firmware updates is absolutely awesome. And uh, more recently, uh, Microsoft is also putting expedited updates, not as expedited updates as some of you might know from Windows Update for Business, but they are actually monitoring that. This is where uh, what automation is actually getting quite good because otherwise, if you were using uh, expedited updates in Intune, you had to go change the policies on a regular basis, make sure you are on the certain ver the latest version of the expedited updates. This is all done by uh, by Windows Auto Patch uh, these days. Then we have uh, Office uh, configurations for, for for Microsoft 365 apps or Office, which is okay. There's a few limitations. Um, we'll get back to that in a second. Um, Microsoft Edge is basically just the choice of channel. Um, so all you can do if, if you will get current channel of Edge, um, if you are uh, an early adopter in, in Windows Auto Patch, you might end up with a beta, which I think is crazy. Uh, but otherwise, there's not much to say about Edge in this one and absolutely nothing about uh, Teams. Uh, it's there, and uh, I, I don't see much management of, of Microsoft Teams as, as of today. So it's primarily Windows, 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 and then uh, at least some Microsoft Office. So when enabling um, uh, Windows Auto Patch in a tenant, a lot of stuff goes on. Uh, it's fairly good documented. Um, and uh, most of the names in documentation actually uh, does uh, match uh, reality. Um, but at least there's a there's a quite good way to to look this up. Um, a lot of groups is created, and I would say uh, there's one group you need to know, and this is this Windows Auto Pass device registration. This is the group that you need to add your devices to. That's all you need to know. If you add your device to that group, um, they will be enrolled into Auto Pass completely automatically. That's the only group you need to know about. However. Make sure that uh, you only have one level of nested groups, otherwise it will it will not work. Um, so need to be aware of that. So you can have a group in that group, some kind of dynamic group, whatever. Um, so so that's how to do that. And again, you can add the device group. We just looked at for the new Windows Autopilot device preparation. You can add that to that group as well. It'll work as long as you only have one level of nested groups. Um, and again, if you have a lot of devices that is currently um, like old devices, uh, make sure to get rid of them, find a way to not add them to auto, the AutoPads enrollment group as, as they will just, you know, make the whole reporting uh, a bit annoying. Uh, but this is all about uh, group management in, in Intra. 
Um, there's no include exclude as we usually know from 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 Intune. You can point to this one group. So if you want to leave devices out, you have to do some fancy dynamic intro ID group uh, magic to to make that happen. So anyhow, make sure that that uh, your devices are are fairly clean. That will give you a much cleaner uh, reporting. There's one other group though I want to. Um, um, make sure you know about um, is the Windows Auto Patch devices all. Um, I have several uh, what's called Auto Patch deployment groups, and they have their own sort of uh, uh, group regime. However, any device that is enrolled into Auto Patch in any how will be part of the Windows Auto Patch devices. Why is that important? Well, it's not until we get a bit later in, in, in this AutoPads thing, because it's actually quite useful for some things. But this is a group that is managed by AutoPads. So whatever device is enrolled will be part of that group. So this is what's happening. You have to identify and, and your devices, make sure they are part of uh, the enrollment uh, device, AutoPads device registration group. And everything from there is basically automatically. Everything is done. Um, what you can do uh, when when it's sort of starting to, to roll, that is, of course, you can monitor everything is fine. And if you want or if you choose, you can actually move devices from between rings. So usually you'll have uh, two to three rings. And if you want to move a device to an earlier or later ring, uh, you'll be able to do that. But otherwise, everything is done um, for you. Um, and please do not try to do fancy stuff. Uh, it will be either well written or you will break uh, the service and it, you'll have some often groups uh, and sessions that you can get rid of. And that will require Microsoft uh, support case to actually get it fixed. Um, one thing we uh, we experienced uh, doing um, doing the what's called private preview and, and the early at, uh, versions of uh, Microsoft Copilot, there was a requirement to run current channel to actually have Copilot enabled in in, in your Office products. Um, and Office is in AutoPads world actually configured to be a monthly channel, meaning we didn't have any Copilot. So we were changing the policy. And uh, some weeks we did it two or three times a week, and other weeks uh, only once. But the, the service will reconfigure the policies to align with whatever is a, um, configured uh, as part of the autopilot. So please don't don't change the policies. Um, best case, the policies will be reset back to whatever Microsoft thinks it should be. Uh, worst case is that you'll break uh, the service and you end up in in a in a weird state. So the whole middle thing is completely automatically. And uh, if you're into that, uh, I think it's pretty cool. So again, if you go into your, um, into your into Intune, you have all your devices uh, within Autopads. You'll see you, I have this overview. I've added some devices. I have a few devices called Interactive. Um, in this case, uh, I also have this pane called Not Ready meaning they are not ready for, in this case, they are basically not being turned on for quite some time. And in my case, I don't have any devices that is not registered, which is pretty cool. Um, we also have some uh, some other things within not ready. Um, there's a few uh, registry values that you need to be aware of. Uh, it will show up like uh, attention required or attention needed, I believe. Uh, meaning that, that there might be some policies or some application packages, whatever, that is configuring like some WSOS settings. They will show up here. There is a, a list of, I, think, I believe, five or, or, or six uh, policy settings that must not be available or configured on the device that will break auto patch. And, uh, they will show up here as uh, attention needed. Um, if you do have uh, devices that is currently running in in uh, in co-management with uh, Microsoft Intune and Configuration Manager working together, and you are considering moving what's called a workload from 
having config manager to manage updating to auto patch, we have seen many, many times that removing the workload from config manager to, to, to Microsoft Intune will not clean up the registry policy settings within the config manager agent. So you need to find a way to remove those settings. Um, in, in my case, we, we created a uh, remediation script, which is part of uh, the Intune license, if you have that, you can use uh, remediation scripts to, to clean clean that up. That gives you a few uh, possibilities to actually see what's going on. Um, I have customers where we've seen these uh, registry keys keep uh, reappearing. Um, and 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 one particular customer that actually took, took us just about a month to figure out where the hell those settings were deployed from. Um, but yeah, uh, IT people are doing crazy stuff. Um, so they were doing crazy stuff and uh, it actually we managed to figure out where where they came from and everything was fine but just keep uh, keep that in mind you might have this attention needed so it's it's quite cool if we go down to the release management i have my uh, my quality update configurations and uh, in this case you'll see i have various um uh, releases um and I have, in this case, I have uh, the first one here. I have ring one, two, and three, which is uh, automatically being uh, managed by Autopatch. And then every ring also have a test group and a last group. It's important to say that Autopatch is not assigning any devices to the test group or the last group. You can do it manually, though. Um, but otherwise, uh, it's only the, the rings that's actually called ring one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever you have, uh, that is maintained by by uh, by auto patch. So in this case, you will see I have uh, sixty seven percent uh, running Windows Eleven June release. Um, in this case, my ring one is hundred percent. I do have a few down here that is still uh, lacking uh, the latest update. Um, one of the better features is uh, the feature update. Again, um, the default release is the one that is created. And please be aware if you don't do anything. Oh dear. Um, this one, can we move that? No. It's actually default. Oh, oh here it is. It's actually defaulting to Windows 10, 21H2, meaning um, if you have Windows 10 versions uh, older than 21H2, they will be updated to 21H2. If you have newer versions of Windows 10, um, they will be whatever build they are on, um, which is basically only one build, which is 22H2, which is fine. However, if you do have Windows 11 in your environment and uh, you, you are expecting them to be updated to the latest Windows um, Windows 11 build, that's not going to happen because they are already above Windows 10 21 H2, meaning that's the reason why I have created these two. Um, we actually go in and, and, and enforce the versions of, of Windows uh, that I want to use in, in my environment. And the way to do so is this awesome thing called auto patch groups. So if I just go back to my uh, my groups, patch, you'll see all uh, all these groups. Um, can we solve this? There you go. So this one is my default Windows Auto Patch device registration group. So what I did, I went in and I created uh, two new groups. Um, I'm just using the name standard, Windows Auto Patch device registration, Windows 11, Windows 10. And in this case, I created a dynamic uh, group. So in this case, I look for, um, for, uh, for the version of, of the OS. Um, I also looked for for some other uh, groups. Um, but again, 
primarily this is basically all my Windows 10 devices. And this is really just intra ID um, dynamic group gymnastics. It could be static groups, you name it. In this case, I have now um, created these two groups holding my Windows 10 and Windows 11. Um, and what I then did, I went into devices, um, release management, also patch groups, and I created two new groups. This is called also patch Windows 10, Windows 11. I'll just go through it. Windows devices, let's call it demo. And then you'll see I have my deployment rings and default you have this uh, Windows device demo test and Windows device demo last. This is the default ones that will not have any uh, devices and assigned to them. Then you will have to add a group. Um, so this is the, the, the device enrollment group you need to, you, you want to add. Let me just, oh, no, I don't want, let's go for the, all my Nova devices in this case. Then you get this uh, warning, dynamic distribution person must be 100%. Well, what's that about? Well, you need at least one uh, deployment ring. Um, again, I can add as many as I want. I have no idea what the sort of uh, maximum number is. But let's say I have a, a, a big organization, I've added all these groups, and now I have to sort of put in the percentages. However, I can just uh, click on this one, apply default dynamic groups, and it will add the various uh, percentages to the group, and I can start pinging them around. And I can say, well, that's a few too many. I want to get rid of some of them. And yeah, I'll take another one. And again, um, it doesn't add up, but again, I click here and it will try to, to rectify it. Uh, in, 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 in this particular scenario, I might go five, I might go uh, 15, um, I might go 25. So now I have to do a bit of math. That's 50-ish, right? No, 55. There you go. Um, so it's up to me how these rings are, are being managed and how many devices I want in each. Uh, and this is completely done by um, by uh, the Autopad service. Again, um, this is my my deadlines. So usually it'll take eleven days for my for my devices to be updated and and rebooted. Um, depending on how many rings you have, but we'll still have 11 days. So if that is too fast, uh, yeah, if you don't like the way it's, it's done, well, then you have to go out of auto patch and start using Windows Update for Business instead. Um, and we do have customers that, that are actually running auto patch for some devices and using Windows Update for Business for like production environments where they need more control or if they don't, want to be the, the Windows Update service to actually update drivers, etc. So there's a way to combine this. Just be uh, keep in mind that this is just completely standard group membership. If you have a device that is part of uh, a Windows Auto Patch group and a Windows Update for Business uh, assignment group, you will have a conflict and you will have to con uh, resolve that conflict as as with everything else in Intune. You can only assign one policy uh, with the same settings uh, per device. Again, I can go uh, great and, and, and then I have uh, my, my new group and then that could be, in this case, called demo. That could be the uh, finance department, that could be whatever. Uh, we usually tend to create a group for Windows 10 and Windows 11 because then we can actually control rollout. So in this case, if I go back to the release schedule, Windows feature, um, what we have done 
is basically um, using the same group to deploy a target version of Windows. And now I'm in charge of which version of uh, Windows I want to use. In this case, I want to go Windows 10 22H2. And on my, oh, sorry, well, Windows 11, I have chosen to go Windows 11 22H2. So what I can do now, I can actually create a new release. Uh, let's call it uh, Windows 11 24H2. And in this case, I can select any version. But well, in this case, I'm not able to select 20, 24H2. Funny enough, let's just go with this one uh, for now. And again, I can create this feature update saying, well, this is the one, or it could be this one. So now I'm actually about to do a rollout for my existing Windows 10 devices um to make sure that they are upgraded to windows 11. again this is just the groups that i have chosen there's not much you really can do here um you can change rings but otherwise the, the fun part is over here where you can actually choose the release schedule meaning in this case it will take um just before Christmas for all devices to be upgraded to um, to Windows 11. In this case, it was Windows 10 devices. Um, and we have standard Windows Update for Business uh, policies. Let's say um, this is crazy. I can't wait. I want to start today. Oh, I can select today. I can select tomorrow. If I really want to push it, I cannot select tomorrow, but I can select the day after. So meaning these rings can have no less than one day in between. So if you are having uh, the urge to update your, let's say Windows 10 devices, make sure they're running Windows 10 20. 22H2. This is the fastest uh, deployment you can do. Um, and we've done that quite a few times. But I do like the fact that I can actually schedule that. However, uh, you might end up having a scenario where you have a hard time controlling the rollout because we're using the, the gradual rollout groups, meaning it's a, it's a bit of Microsoft magic whoever is, is getting the, 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 the update and when. Um, what we have done previously, by the way, um, creating uh, feature updates Sorry, here, um, just keep in mind that you will not, in this one, I have one here with inactive. There's no way to delete it. So you can you can make it inactive, but you cannot delete um, um, a feature update or feature schedule. Um, you can, however, remove the deployment groups. Um, so what you could do if you want to control, let's say, I want to be able to to uh, roll out for a uh, the finance department. If you want to be able to control it. You could add. Um, yes, we're going to have to wrap it up. You can add a. You can add a group here, and you could say, "Oh, it didn't, didn't like that." Yes, Jasper. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we need to wrap up. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. In the chat as well. Um, if I'm done. I'm done in you, one second. Yeah. Okay, so fini finishing up, um, this is probably the best way to control it. Only have one ring, go 100%. That will work perfectly. Um, and there's way ways, ways to actually um, enable this. You can do a controller, you can do a big bang, you could do whatever. It works perfectly. However, be keep in mind that, that, that Microsoft Edge does not have an update um, policy, like an update behavior policy. That's not part of Watchpatch. You need to create that. Um, and then 
uh, because we're wrapping up, please be in mind, keep in mind that if you are using Microsoft 365 App Cloud Update Policy, that could interfere with, with your autopatch, meaning you might end up having, uh, you think you are having monthly channel, um, but but because if you're using the cloud update policy, you might having a different scenario on, on your devices. Cool. I could talk about this all day. Any questions? Or we have to leave. Yeah, there's one from Josh. If he's still in, if he's still on the call, still in it. Yeah, I'm here. Um, Josh? just go. Sorry, I'll find my question. So I wrote it down. Um, if a business has Windows Update for Business configured and working well, what's mm -hmm. the driver, mm -hmm. if any, to move to Windows Auto Patch? Uh, in my opinion, there's two. Uh, the the first one will be the uh, expedited update, the expedited policy update. That is something you have to do manually. Uh, you have to make sure you have chosen the the latest one if you want if you're using expedited uh, updates. Um, that is bypassing all you know settings in Windows Update for Business about how many days should it, you be late before you enforce a restart, et cetera. But if it's a zero day, you really want it out. So that is a manual process. And then the other manual process is assignment. Um, what I really like about Auto, AutoPads is the way that that is assigning the devices to the groups for me. I don't have to build these groups myself. I don't have to maintain them. Um, I build Windows Update for Business uh, many places where we have actually assigned policies to users, which is quite cool. Um, but but in this case, it's it's device assignment and it's maintained uh, manually. But otherwise, if you're using Windows Update for Business and you are satisfied with that, please, by all means, keep on going. Just make sure you enable drive updates and everything. I think you'll be fine. Uh, another reason to use Windows Update for Business is either the control by policy driver thing for production environment. But if you are having environments with Windows Insider builds, that is today not possible to control. Um, what in auto pads? Okay, cool. I'll do some research, I guess. But thanks for that. No worries. Hello, questions. Last call. Anyone? No. no. Right. <laughs> we'll we'll wrap up there. I know Jess, we could keep going on forever on your passion, <laughs> which is great to see. Um, but that's very informative. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time out to share with us your knowledge today. I'm sure uh, everyone's taking something away from that. But yeah, again, thank you very much. You yeah, else no. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it's been a long time coming trying to get Jasper on the call. Uh, we've had you know, a couple of uh, attempts in the past, but he's a he's a busy man, so I don't know he was able to move some, move some mountains aside for us. Um, have the recording of this up on the yeah absolutely um, and everything once so. he gets it asked for me i will get it uploaded and uh yeah show notes and links and all that as soon as possible um again thanks for coming uh people in person and uh, those joining online uh hope to see you next month it'll be that is uh first tuesday of august um on Great intelligence and, um, yeah you can connect and around out there as long as he doesn't kick you out because it's past five. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. No worries. Thank you. Thank you.